first off, we've got to talk about what is a chemical reaction and how things work. Uh, I'll go to tell you, if you are a cook or if you like to cook, this is going to be easy for you because you already get an idea of how things work. <laughs> you like to eat. Uh, but uh, anyway, so if you do like to cook, this is going to be good. But first off, let's break things down a little bit. What is a chemical reaction? Uh, a chemical reaction or a change is basically where we take substances and we turn them into new substances. However, we don't change the elements. Uh, remember, I've gone over this law of conservation of matter, and again, this is going to be on your test. It's very important. It's basically what chemistry is all based around. It's all about the uh, conservation. Matter is not created nor destroyed. It's just rearranged. And y'all are going to be doing lots of rearranging. So a lot of people think that something when you boil water, matter's destroyed. It's not destroyed. We just uh, rearrange it to where it floats off. And that's one of the problems we get. If you lose something, it's probably due to gas. Uh, so anyway, you got something that you start with, which we like to call the reactants. Notice I put that in the color red. And then you got stuff you end, it, end with, which is the products. Think of like an assembly line or inside of an industrial shop. Uh, you got stuff that you got to put together. And after you put it together, you have your product. So you can think of it like that. In terms of cooking, uh, you got your ingredients, which is like uh, when you're making biscuits, flour, yeast, uh, depending on how you make it, um, butter, cornmeal, when you're making cornbread, things like that. Anyway, you got your ingredients, which are basically the reactants. After you put them all together and mix them up, and you put it in the oven, you take it back out, you get your products. And that's basically the same idea. So when we do chemistry and when you're in the lab and you're mixing stuff together, this is basically what happens. But keep in mind here, we're not destroying anything. We're not creating something new. We're just rearranging the matter that's already there. That's all we're doing. That's what this whole unit is about, is actually the study of how we rearrange these things. Why do they want to be with another element? Why not be with the, just anybody? There are rules to actually follow. OK, so just like in cooking, you got somebody who's a very happy student. Obviously, this looks like it was taken right from a textbook. Probably was. But anyway, what, if you look over here, you got your, it looks like your flour, your yeast, your bowl, you're trying to make bread. Okay. So what do we call this stuff? Okay. Not cocaine. cocaine. Those are all the, those are all the reactants. Those are all your reactants. These are your ingredients, okay? And then after we mix everything together and we put it in the oven, you then get the last part, which uh, is bread. your bread or your products. And that's typically how things are going to go. We're going to go from reactants to products. There's a beginning and an end. Fantastic. However, sometimes you can take your products and go backwards. Now, however, in this instance, can you take the bread, break it back down to flour and all that? Yeah, you can't really uncook it. It's already been rearranged. I will say you can do it, but it is not energy favorable and it won't happen. Why would you want to go back anyway? Uh, bread tastes better than flour by itself. So what is a reactant? The starting substance. It's always going to be on the left side of a reaction. You're going to see me start drawing arrows. So if the reactants are on the left, guess who's on the right? Y'all products. By the way, the arrow will always point towards the product. And it's always on the right side. I mean, in America, we read from left to right. So obviously, the reactants are on the left, and products are on the right. Now, please don't mix this up like a math uh, equation. Okay, We do not use an equal sign. And I'm about to show you that here. We use an arrow. There is a difference between an equal sign and an arrow. Equal is math, arrow is chemistry. So let's actually take a look at what a reaction is. So on the left side, we have our reactants and our products are on the right. Normally, you won't see the word reactant and product. But if you take a look over here, let's say we mix these two guys together. This is zinc. That is iodine. Uh, and y'all are familiar with iodine. Y'all have seen this. Actually, you've seen zinc, but that's in a powder. Uh, but anyway, we mix them together, and they actually react, and they produce zinc iodine. Now, however, it looks like I squished them together. But did I really squish? No. No. How do you know how some of these products are produced? Well, everything you did last unit is going to play into this part. For example, you got the zinc and the iodine. And when they react, you basically got to write the new formula. And it looks like we just squish them together. But don't get that misconception. This is what happens when we do reactants. We basically take everything and we drop all the subscripts unless they're a poly. Remember how I said keep the subscript with the poly? 
same rule applies. So what we do, we take all this crap and we just scatter it around. So we just say like we got zinc and we got iodine. So we drop the subscripts. Uh, the reason why we do that is because they then go into what we like to call ions. And you remember what ions are. Those are the things with the charges. So what is the charge of zinc? Two. What is the charge of iodine? One. Negative one. Crisscross. Z and I2. That's why it's Z and I2. Dang. Not because it looks like they squish them together. I want you to go ahead and not get that misconception. Because as soon as we get started and you're like, oh, we're just squishing things. No squishy. We're not squishing. We are still crisscrossing. It is very important that you know how to do that. Uh, but this is the reason why we get to this point. You will have to end up predicting products, and that is the hardest part of this unit. I'm going to basically give you this side of the equation, and you're going to have to predict what it's going to turn into. Everything from the previous unit is going to tell you how to do that. So if you didn't master the last unit, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. So left side is the reactants. Do you realize what the heck the arrow means? You can make the arrow as long as you want, whatever makes you feel good. Uh, but typically, you'll see me draw it real short, so this person actually drew it pretty long. Uh, but just know it means yield. It also means other things, and I'm going to write them on the board. Think of some other words besides yields. Yields, y'all think of stop because of the stop sign, but that's not really what it means in chemistry. Carry turns to. Turns to. Mm, I could do that. I wouldn't want to say equals because that gets it. Technically, yes. But if we say equals, it's more of a math concept. So she's not wrong, but then again, we don't want to use that. Um, what's another thing you say? Well, if you're getting a product, you could say to what? If you're getting a product, it has been produced. produced. To produce, they can also say, uh, what else is there? To yield, to produce. Uh, Will we say to create? Uh-uh. Mm -mm. No, don't uh, want to use that word. Form. Mm, no. To produce, to that. I forget what the third one is. Build. To f oh, here we go. I almost forgot about it. Oh, to form. Uh, so these are the main things that I'm telling you. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to give you a sentence. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to give you a sentence, and you're going to have to know when to actually, when you see to yield, to form, to produce. That really just means the arrow, if that helps out a little bit. Uh, you could also see another one, but this is a special one, and it only works on decomposition reactions. To decompose. And only decomposition reactions uh, will actually use this. And what does decompose mean? Break, break, break down. down. So if we reverse this reaction, we could technically break it back apart. Uh, it's not really energy favorable, but we could do it. It is possible. The only problem is we really can't do it with bread. Forming bonds, here's the thing. Every time we break a bond, energy is released, and every time we form a bond, it takes energy to form it, or it absorbs it. Um, so there's actually a breakdown between each one. That gets into more thermodynamics. Lucky for you guys, you don't have to do it, even though it is probably one of the more interesting parts. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> So let's talk about what's going on here. First off, if you break a bond, this is called exothermic. You do need to know exo and endo. Um, Exo's outside, endo's inside. There you go. So basically, energy is being released if it's exo. If you exit the building, you're leaving, right? So if energy leaves a reaction, it releases energy. Now, some of y'all might not recognize what's up there, but this is a uh, combustion reaction. Oh my God. Y'all actually did this in lab, you don't realize it. But every time y'all lit a Bunsen burner, that's what's happening. Is it hot? Yeah. Therefore, it's releasing energy. Yeah. And I'll give you a quick rundown. If it's hot, it's exo. Oh, okay. You can feel the heat coming off of it. You feel the energy. If it's endo, what do you think it's going to feel like then? Cold. I'm going to. Break your reality again. Remember how I told you like you can't really see color, like you only can see the wavelengths of light reflecting off something? Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to break your I'm gonna blow your mind right now. Even my dad does not believe me on this. Okay. There is no such thing as cold. Cold does not exist. Okay? For example, okay, if I turn off the light, 
it then becomes what? <laughs> Dark. Dark is basically the absence of light. Okay. So cold is the absence of energy. So in reality, when you feel something cold, that's the lack of energy. How do you think refrigerator, if you actually, people who are AC workers and uh, work on refrigerators, they know this concept because their engines actually remove energy from the system. How an AC works, I don't know if y'all realize this, there's that little vent at the bottom and there's a vent at the top. That sucks in air, that blows it out. What they do is basically rotate out the air. They're sucking out the heat from the bottom and they're blowing in cold from the top, which actually the, probably better if they flipped them because heat rises. Uh, but basically that's how AC works. It's actually in the same way your refrigerator works, same thing how your car works. It's basically sucking out hot air and blowing in cooler air. Anyway, do you see that little blue line? This is called activation energy. So here's the thing, when you mix let's say the gas from the Bunsen burner and the air uh, together, does it automatically blow up? Uh -uh. No. What else you got to do to make it react? Uh, a flame. Put a flame to it or spark. Remember that? Um, so basically that spark is the activation energy. Once it is reacted, it takes off. It's that one little like push. It's like, kind of like how you start your car engine. Once you start it, it's off. You don't have to crank it. You don't have to keep the key turned. It's just like cranking an engine. Once it's gone, it's taken off until you shut it off. Uh, basically, that's what that whole idea is. You need to know what activation energy is, and it's basically, just like it says, it's the energy necessary to cause a reaction to occur, to activate. So this little reaction is the same thing that you have in the uh, lab. Basically, this is how your bunch of butter works. When y'all open up that barrel and turn the uh, flame blue, uh, you're letting in O2, which is increasing the combustion. However, you could let too much air in, or if you actually blow on it, you're actually putting out the flame. That's because you're adding too much O2, and that kills the reaction. You're kind of suffocating the gas. So you want a good balance between the two. Just to let you know, yes, the two products that are coming out of the flame is CO2 and H2O. Now you're like, well, why don't I see the water? It's in a, they're both in a gaseous form. So whenever you crank up uh, the heat in the lab, the reason why it starts getting a little bit more humid when you light up a bunch of burn, one, it's getting hot, and two, you're putting more water in the air. You might notice you start how it gets a little bit more humid in there. Exactly. Endothermic is vice versa. Notice the sides have flip-flopped. We can take those two products and reverse the reaction. There, excuse me. There's only one way to do that, and it's not through uh, setting things on fire. Um, does anybody know what this compound is, the C6H12O6? Glucose. That is glucose. What is the only thing on the planet that can take those two things and make uh, glucose? Plants. plants. So guess what? Energy is absorbed right here. Basically, plants are the only thing on the planet that naturally that can actually absorb energy from our sun and turn it into something useful. Store the bond in the bonds of the glucose molecule or sucrose, depending on what you're eating, or fructose and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, this is also basically what we call photosynthesis. That whole reaction I just showed you, that's an endothermic. What do plants drink? Coke. That was ironic. Uh, no, they don't drink Coke. They also don't drink electrolytes. Uh, from that movie. It's on the board right here. Water. So, and it also uses the chlorophyll inside its leaves to absorb energy from the sun. That's how, where the energy is coming from to form the bonds. Um, and also it breathes in carbon dioxide, the stuff we exhale. It takes two broke down products and act, I mean, or two products and actually turn it back around, turn it something more useful. That's why we do need plants. Um, here's the other thing, just as a byproduct, they're making energy for themselves to live and also for other things to eat off of, obviously. Uh, but the byproduct is that it releases oxygen back in the air. It doesn't do that on purpose. It's just a byproduct. It's actually saving our lives, and naturally. And yet we also save it by exhaling carbon dioxide. So you can kind of see how the circle of life actually works out in here. So endothermic absorbs energy. Now here's the thing, a lot of people think because it absorbs energy, therefore it's getting hot. No, if you're absorbing the energy, that means that you're removing the energy from the area. Therefore, it's gonna feel colder. Now, yes, plants can feel warm because they get absorbed of the sun, but uh, if you've ever feel like a cold pack 
um, I don't know, in the, if you're an athlete, they might break these two little chemicals together and it gets really cold. That's an endothermic reaction. It's very, very cold. It's absorbing energy from the outside and making everything feel really, really chilly. So let's take that first reaction with the methane, how we lit things on fire. How you can see all this is very, very straightforward. Chemical reaction, the bonds break and they're rearranged to form products. Basically, it's a lot like an investment. You gotta spend a little money to make money, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in an exothermic reaction, you're actually spending money and not getting any back. Losing you're losing energy in terms of the currency that we're using here. Uh, but once you get it broke, then they're released. You can get it back, but uh, that's what plants do. They can actually take those two products and rearrange them. So in a chemical reaction, this can be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So think of a couple that you really want to break up. Okay, notice that re uh, people can break up spontaneously or non-spontaneous. You watch shows all the time. Somebody has to put forth a little bit of energy to make these two people break up, right? Okay, so would that be spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Non-spontaneous. They have to put energy in. They have to force it to happen. So it's not going to happen by itself. Okay. However, if you just let nature take its course and it happens on its own, that would be spontaneous. And see how the words actually work out in your favor? They actually mean things. So do remember this. Spontaneous breakup occurs with no effort. It just naturally occurs. Non-spontaneous, it needs a little help to get started. So just like how y'all have to uh, light the Bunsen burner, you have to use a, a little bit of spark or a match, that's non-spontaneous. You got to give it a little bit of help. It's not gonna occur by itself. However, if y'all mix two things together and it blows up, that's spontaneous. See the difference between the two? Yeah. Okay. And we can use this to our advantage so we don't kill ourselves. That's one reason why I'm telling you right now. Some things are spontaneous, some things are not. All right, so look at each one of these guys. Let's take a look at the reaction scheme. Methane reacts to, with oxygen to yield carbon dioxide and water. Y'all can actually break down these words. Uh, methane is actually the CH4. Reacts, usually it's going to be a plus sign. Oxygen, why is it O2? Isn't it one of those seven diatomics? Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason why. So that's the reason why it can't just be O. Uh, Use your words. <laughs> what is it, Lassie? Uh, Nalfukubri. Oh, Nalfukubri. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you were <laughs> saying. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about where these bonds break real quick, okay? Uh, notice, do you see anything still touching the same stuff as it was over here? In other words, off to the right, do you still see it touching the same thing as it was touching over here to the left? No, everything was broken, which was awesome because every time one of these bonds break, energy is released. So there's a bond breaking here, 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 and here. Six bonds have been broken. However, also bonds were formed here, 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 and here. So every time this stuff reacts, this is how much energy is being absorbed and broken. Uh, Every time they bond with a certain element, that either costs energy or requires certain energy to be taken in, and vice versa. It's the same currency. Uh, luckily, y'all don't have to really go too much in depth with that, but I'm just telling you mm, what's happening. There's more energy being spent here than being taken back in over here. That's basically what I'm saying. So what you need to know is this, though. We're not going to go too much into the numbers of energy. I like it a lot better because it makes more sense, but whatever. Anyway, you got the word equation, then you got the formula equation. Word equation, basically this, uses words. In other words, sentences. And yeah, you're going to have to write complete sentences. Word. Just be sure you capitalize and end with a period. So just like this one just said, methane or carbon tetrahydride, if that's what y'all learned last unit, uh, reacts with oxygen gas to form CO2 and water. That's not hard. You also be able to actually read these equations forwards and backwards. So everything we did last unit, we're now kicking it up a notch. It's basically a continuum. All right, so this is a word equation. Methane reacts with oxygen to yield carbon dioxide and water. So guess what? If it says reacts with, that's the plus sign. If it says to yield, to form, to produce, that's the arrow. And on the right side, it's always going to have basically, so the reacts is the plus sign, to yield is the arrow. 
Uh, if it, on the right side, though, they don't say reacts with because it's already reacted. They'll just say and. and. That's it. So how would you write this? It's very easy. Y'all can actually look to the left, and all you're doing is writing the name of the equations and filling in the gaps. Don't worry. You'll get some practice. And don't worry. I'm going to come back to that. So formula equation, chemical reaction using formulas. Wow, names make sense. Anyway, this is your formula equation. That's your word equation. Not much difference. Yeah. Now, we got to talk about what the heck are these numbers in the front, okay? Those are the coefficients we talked about last unit. That's balancing. We're going to talk about balancing here in a little bit. So, what I want you to do right now, this is your first rundown. We got to actually start implementing what we learned last unit. So, try to write a formula equation based on this. Calcium reacts with oxygen to produce calcium oxide. First off, read it from left to right and just put things in place. First off, it says calcium. What is the symbol for calcium? C A. Ka. All right. Reacts. Notice I even highlighted that word. If you see reacts, what Plus. sign is that? Plus. Plus sign. With oxygen. O. Now. O2. O2. Why does it have to be O2? Because so it's the guy, it's the, it's the birth mixture. The Hanoff oh. Klebri. Don't forget those seven diatomics. Okay? So here's the thing. Shh, listen. So if you see the word oxygen, that really means O2. It does not mean O. Be careful. If you see, if I said hydrogen and just hydrogen and nothing else, H2. If I said nitrogen, N2. That's what I mean by that. So don't forget about these seven. We talked about them back in units two or three. One of the two. I think it was three. Um, I think it was we both did periodic table during that time. I think it was unit three. Um, but anyway, I rewrote them up here just in case. So if you do see these guys by themselves, they have to get a subscript of two. However, if they're already bonded, they don't. You just bond them together. So after oxygen comes to produce, all right, and calcium oxide. So a lot of people, though, are just going to write CA and O, C -A which is o. hypothetically correct. However, uh, don't do that. Do not just squish. You need to crisscross charges. Anytime you see a compound, you've got to crisscross the charges. That's where I, everything from the previous unit came to place. Yeah, so happen it is going to end up being CAO, but you need to know why. And this is the part where people get messed up on the, uh, the test. They forget everything from unit four. They just throw it out the way. So when you do crisscross, it does end up being CA2O2, but do realize that not every compound is going to come out like that. Okay, so there we go. However, like I said, on the product side, do not forget the charge. I guarantee people are going to have trouble with that. Um, but anyway, yep, there you go. However, you'll notice there's an issue here. How many calciums you got over here? How many calciums? How many oxygens? How many oxygens? We'll have to get back to the balancing part. Remember those little whole number, uh, whole coefficients that we were talking about? That right there? Oh. That's how you fix that. We're going to do the balancing here in a little bit. Uh, keep that one off to the side. We'll come back and balance it. If you already balanced it, good for you. Uh, if you haven't yet, we'll come back to it. Right now, let's do the next one. All right, so how to do this one? Obviously, I kind of kept it in order, but by the way, you just can't write silver nitrate. Uh, luckily, though, their charges are the same. So anytime you see a compound, don't forget to be sure you crisscross the charges. That should be a rhythm by now. Charge of silver. Plus one. Charge of nitrate. Not plus one. Negative one. So you crisscross these and you get, just so happen, NO3. Now you'll notice I keep the parentheses even though, uh, because that's going to be important later on because you're going to start moving compounds around. So it says reacts with copper. So what do you do? Do I give it a two? Do I give it a two? No. Why not? Because it's not there yet, man. Not there. We're not there. All right. We let the worm back in the van. He ain't going to bother nobody. All right. Um, <laughs> sorry. There's a skit about that. Uh, to form uh, copper two nitrate. So here's the problem, though. You got to crisscross the charges. A lot of y'all are just going to start skipping that step. 
Don't skip. So when you get the new formula, you should get CuNO3 with a 2 on the outside. 2. All right. And silver. Does it get a 2? No. That's it. As long as you know the crisscross and you've done it from the previous unit, it is. But if you haven't, you're going to have some problems. And there's no easy way. Uh, next one. You can do it. Oh, by the way, sometimes the equation, uh, they'll, if they think it's not one you normally have done, or I'll go ahead and tell you if, uh, if it's one that's like glucose. I don't expect you to know glucose is C6H12O6 right off the top of your head. That's, you know, you should, but um, I'm not going to do that. If I actually said the word glucose, I would actually write the formula right here. So sometimes they give you what the previous compound is in parentheses. They're actually that nice. They gave you H2O2. Then they say, we'll decompose. So what did we say a little special one was going to be? Sometimes you'll get the word decompose. It's the same thing as the arrow. So after that, it says into water and oxygen. Well, what is water? Now, that one I do expect you to know off the top of your head. Um, and oxygen. Don't forget the two. So there we have our formula. Basically, guys, you remember how if you ever cleaned a wound with uh, hydrogen peroxide? That's what's happening. It bubbles up. What's bubbling off is oxygen. Surprise. And what's left over is water. All right, so again, this is the fifth time I've given you this note. Law of conservation matter. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in any chemical or physical process. That is the same note as you just took down earlier. So basically, because of this law, the number of atoms you start with, aka the reactants, the 20 pounds of water and the one pound of sugar, is the same number you're going to end with. Put them together. That's basically what we're talking about here. Um, so because of this, we are actually able to figure out where do some of this stuff go, and or where does some of it go, and basically how many moles and stuff we can predict. And what is moles? Well, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Those little coefficients you're about to use, that's basically what they are as moles. Okay, so because of that, we have to go back and we have to actually have to balance. Again, this is a question on your next test. People keep forgetting. Why do we have to go back and balance? Well, again, did we end up with the same number of stuff that we begun with? Is this the same number as this? One calcium, one calcium. Two oxygens, one oxygen. Yes. Are they the same? No. no. They're not the same. So basically what you got is a scale imbalance. You got to make them even. They have to be exactly the same. This is why you have to go back and balance. That is going to be a question on your test. And again, that answers it right here. Law of conservation matter would be violated if you just did not have the same mass that you started with. So we got to keep the same amount of atoms with everywhere. So some people are like, well, can we take away stuff? Nope, that violates the conservation of matter too. But what you can do is fix the ratio, okay? So you remember how basically you got a ratio right here that's unbalanced? We want to make them equal. So in other words, we got to make the, both these sides the same. And if you actually heard anything I just said, then you got it. In front of the compounds, you need to balance the reaction. You may not change the subscripts. You may not change the subscripts. You may not change the subscripts. You can't change the subscripts. Yeah, you can. In other words, you can't change this. Maybe you can. Why? Because you already crisscrossed the charges. That's how they react. You can't change the subscripts. Okay? You're like, well, wait a minute. I did that over here. No, you fixed the ratio of how they reacted. That has to happen. You can't change that. So when you go back and balance, you can't start removing things. You can't start adding subscripts. But you can do only one thing. You can take the coefficient that goes in the front and balance it out. That is the only rules that you can do. So basically, there's a gap in front of each one of these guys. You can double them, triple them, quadruple them as many times as you like. There's no end to anything there. You're not changing the state of matter. You're balancing out the recipe. Okay? So for example, if I make biscuits, and I just said uh, I'll take one cup of sugar, one cup of flour, one cup of butter, one cup of whatever, and mix them all together. Th that's not going to really work, right? No. 
No, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, baking, right? He's like, yeah. one cup and one cup and one cup. That's not right. No. You need more flour than you need sugar. Yeah. You need more everything else. That's a recipe. What you're doing here when you balance an equation is you're actually fixing the recipe. You're making the recipe balance out. And that's basically the whole breakdown. That's one reason why I said cooking makes it a lot easier. So do not change the subscripts. But you can change how much of each stuff you need to balance it out. Uh, and we already did all about the balancing part. So what are coefficients? Uh, just like a math class, they're the whole numbers you place in the front. That's it. So what you can do is basically go back through and figure out this whole little balancing scheme. Um, again, you can put whatever number you want in the front. However, it must be the lowest number ratio. If you balance something and it's over twice as much or three times as much as you need, you're going to have to go back and actually chop it down. In other words, reduce to the lowest number ratio. And that's what we're going to actually about to do up here. So basically know this. The reactants are on your left and the products are on your right. We're going to talk about what the S and the G and the S is all, all later. Uh, basically, that tells you the state of matter. I mean, that's really it. I've actually, I kind of just told you. Uh, S is for solid, G is for gas, L is for liquid. There will always be real tiny stuff off to the right. Uh, that just tells you what kind of state of matter they're coming in. Basically, though, we really are caring about these whole numbers in front. That little ratio, we got to balance it out. For example, take a look at this aluminum. How many aluminums do you see over here? Four, okay. How many do you see over here? You see two, but what about this? Two times two is four. That's what the little coefficients are. It's basically distributing the property amongst the subscripts. So how many oxygens do I have off to the left here? I have three times two, six, and two times three. Same, same, right? If I did not have those coefficients, so what? Oh. So if I did not have those green numbers in front or those coefficients, it would be unbalanced. And you can't have that. Again, that then violates the law of conservation matter. It has to have the same number you started with as the same number you end with. That's how we make up for those charges uh, when we mix and match stuff. Sometimes it comes out perfectly even like the very first note you did with the zinc and the iodine. That's just, you know, that happens maybe 10% of the time. <laughs> Most of the time you're going to have to do this crap. So anyway, let's go back to these little reactions. Why do I call it rest in peace? Well, it looks like that. Kind of looks like a tombstone. Anyway, so I'm going to do it the short way really fast. And then I'm going to do it the long way, show you how I did it. First off, look over here. You got two oxygens over here. And you got one over here. So what prefix could you put in here, or what coefficient could you put here that would distribute it to make it two? Two. Two times one is two. If you put a one here, there's already one. One times one is one. So you want to put a two here, two times one, two calciums, now two times two, two oxygens. Now here's the thing. Can we put a number in between this guy? Nope. No. You can only do it in front of whole number ratios that you see up here. I'll see some people try to squeeze a number right in between the compounds here. Can't do that. They're conjoined. They're like conjoined twins. You can't break them apart. So don't try. However, you did get two oxygens, but now what's unbalanced? Your calcium. Well, what could you put here to make it two? That's it. You can put a one here if you like, but we don't usually like writing the number one. So how do I do this method dealing with the polys? I still keep the polys all together. Now here's the thing. You can only do this little trick. Now some of y'all probably would separate them. Like, here, okay, here's all my nitrogens, here's all my oxygens. If you see the poly over here and over here, and they're exactly the same, NO3, NO3, you can group them together, and that makes less work on you. Um, that's how I actually end up learning the whole polys was basically by knowing that little rule. Uh, but that was kind of too late by that time. <coughs> Bless you. All right, so we got a silver, we got nitrate, and we got a copper. How many silvers do we have on the left? One. How many nitrates? One. And how many coppers? One. All right, look on your right. How many coppers? One. How many nitrates? Two. Does everybody see why that's two? You see why we have to put the coefficient on the outside? Of the yeah. Okay. That's a big part. And how many silvers? One. So what's out of balance? Nitrate. Stinking nitrate. So we go off to our left here. 
that's the lower one, so we want to try to make it a two. Well, what do we put in here to make it a two? Okay. However, now we also changed our silvers. So now we got to go back. Luckily, this one's by itself. You just got to put a two here, and you're done. You could put a one here and a one there if you want, but me. If it make, it's not wrong if you put the ones up there. I will tell you that. I won't count it off if you do. But it does help out. So now that one's balanced. The last one down here. So how many hydrogens do we have on the left and oxygens? Two, two. Okay. Now, I put this one in here. So you could deal with nitrates. The other thing you could deal with is every time you get an oxygen, be wary. They like to split. And this is what causes This is where you'll have a hard time balancing. It's because of this stinking split right here. Um, how many hydrogens do we have on the right side? Two. How many total Three. oxygens Three. do we have? One here uh -huh. and two here. So that's a total of three. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, this is where people have trouble balancing. Oh, man. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you, that's the hard part. I will tell you this. Here's a hint when balancing. Get rid of odd numbers. We don't like odd numbers. Notice that everything I did on the previous ones, they were even. We want to try to get rid of them. So if you see an odd number, that's the guy you want to try to get rid of. That's a trick. So if you see three over here, we want to try to get rid of it. How, what could we do here to multiply by two to get rid of a odd number? If we do a two in front of here, what's our new total going to be? If I put a two here, two times two is four plus one. That's an odd number. We don't like that. However, if I put a 2 in here instead, 2 times 1 is 2 plus 2. Four. That's what we want. We want even numbers. It's just everything usually balances out by that time. So let's put a 2 in front of here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we change our hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So 2 times 2, or, I'm sorry, 2 times 1 is mm -hmm. 2 plus 2. Four. Four. Yeah. Now, good. we can go back over here. What can we do to both of those to make them four? Two. Boom. Four. And you're done. So again, I will give you a hint here. Even numbers will save you. So much less of a headache, so much more of you not going cross-eyed. Uh, because when I started bouncing out, I never heard these tricks. I had to learn them myself. And as soon as I figured them out, I was like, well, crap, students could do this all the time. Um, I didn't have somebody tell me, so I'm telling you now. However, when we get to combustion reactions, there is another trick I'll show you how to do that, but that only works for combustion. But other than that, we're going to mainly be practicing balancing and writing equations for the next couple of days. All right, so breakdown is this. If you see a certain kind of subscript or a coefficient, you need to know the difference. I already told you this earlier. Uh, coefficients and subscripts. It's just like working out. The subscripts are like the reps and the coefficients are like the sets. And that basically means you have this many sets of that compound. So every time you see a whole number in front, it's just how many sets you have. Uh, that's it. You don't really have to write this down. This was just kind of telling you the difference between subscript and coefficient in case you've been living under a rock. So balancing chemical equations, uh, you got aluminum. And this is actually a reaction that actually takes off. It's actually pretty tough. Uh, but you could write this many different ways. I want you to go ahead and get this idea now. We have not talked about what a mole is, but I want to let you know, we'll end up, you're hearing me call these guys, the coefficients in the front, we'll call them moles. And that's not the little furry animal, it's actually a short name for uh, sets of molecules. Why don't we say aluminum molecules? All right. Because... Is it by itself? Not, yeah. That's why. So if you see aluminum, or if you see calcium, notice we say, we'll say calcium atoms. Over here, we'll say oxygen molecules. If you see a subscript or if it's already bonded to something, you say molecules. If it's by itself, like copper and silver here, you say atoms. You'll see that on the little part. It's not a big deal, but it is a little bit of a deal. It's kind of one of those true and false things. All right, last little thing to be sure you write down before we pick this up a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, breakdown of the arrow. If you have not wrote down what I wrote on the side of the board, to yield. Basically means to produce, to form, or to decompose, but you only see decompose and break down in reactions. Um, be sure you know the difference between what's on the left and what's on the right, and that's really the main thing.
That is the A plus sign. They don't say A T sign, it's A plus sign. Uh, the plus sign does separate between the compounds. The arrow also does too. Luckily on this one, you don't have to balance because there is one carbon, one carbon, two oxygens, two oxygens. Um, do not write the word plus down. They wrote plus, but I'm going to tell you don't write plus because then you'll be tempted to write the equal word, and that's not good. Okay, so we showed you the video yesterday to quickly run down things. Uh, now we've got to put in some blanks of some stuff here. So we did tell you what uh, the S, the G, and the L stood for. So what goes in this little blank right here would be a S, and what goes here? Do you, be sure to keep them lower case. It does matter. Um, now, there was, this is not a state of matter. This is a Q, not a G, but a Q. What that means is it's aqueous. We will see, use this word a lot later. You know how salt dissolves in water? Yeah. You know how sugar dissolves in water? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what aqueous means. It means that it is dissolved. So if I say I have salt water, I don't have an L, I don't have a S because it's dissolved. I have an aqueous solution. That means dissolved, okay? That's not written up here. You're going to need to write that down. You do need to know what AQ means. It means dissolved in. So I would write that off to the side because that's going to be important in the next, well, it's going to be important in this unit, actually. If I have NaCl and I have an S down here, you need to go ahead and have a picture in your mind that that's like table salt before you put it in anything. So like right from the salt shaker. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, well, what if I said I have salt in water? I can't put NaCl L because it's not a liquid phase. Um, I can't say H2O either. So how do we demonstrate that? Because H2O is its own compound. We just give it the AQ. Aqueous. So this means it's dissolved in water or something. So okay. Thing, a yeah. Basically, it what this means. <coughs> if this is a solid, that means it they're bonded together. But whenever you put salt in water, you notice that it dissolves, like it disappears. But it doesn't really disappear. It's there, but it's not there. It's there, but you can't see it because it's dissolved. What happens when it dissolves? is it breaks into those ions we were talking about. But only if it's AQ. If it's solid, it's bonded together. This is one reason why you cannot send a current through this. You can send an electric current through this because of that little plus that you see. Okay, remember metals conduct electricity because they're positive. Okay, this can't conduct because it's already bonded. There's no ions. Okay. Yes, it's ionic bond, but they're not broken down into charges. When you put it in water, it dissolves and it makes these little ions. This is why you get electrocuted. Remember how we talked about that last time? It doesn't go through time? water, it goes through you. It goes through you. You're made up of salt. But whenever you get in water or something like that, your skin, it actually secretes not just sweat, but it also secretes sodium. That's like pruning, right? That's why you've got to replenish your electrolytes when you work out. Oh, That's what electrolyte is. Most of the time, you're going to have sodium and potassium. That's the stuff you need to stay hydrated. If you just put water back in, you're not replenishing your electrolytes. You're not going to stay hydrated. We'll come back to this a little bit more, but I'm telling you right now, what AQ means, you need to think that they're together, but they're in a solution. They're dissolved in water. That's basically what AQ means. All right? So again, let me go ahead and tell you. If you try to put electric current up to table salt, it won't do anything. Okay? If you put it in water, though, then it can electrocute you because it breaks into ions. <coughs> this means yes, yeah. this go means go no, go this go means go back to that again. Can you see the uh, water, the electricity traveling to the No. Water? So you don't see like... No, you don't see it. Light. That's one reason why people have a little bit of trouble with that. But like pure distilled water, like if I had pure water, no ions in it. Now if you go drink something out of the water fountain, it's going to have some ions in it. That's just oil? regular water. But deionized water that you get at the grocery store, it's in a water jug, it's right by the baby water, it's by the spring water, and by the filtered water. There's DI water, or does uh, deionized water, or what else they call it? Um, does it taste different? You don't drink it. It's really used for ironing and things like that because it has no minerals in it. It's just water. 
you're, if you drink that, it actually dehydrates you more because it's pulling out your ions. Why you can drink water from the fountain is because it already has ions in it and it's not going to pull that from your body. It's actually helping replenish some of that stuff. That's why they say, athletes, they say drink uh, Gatorade. Gatorade isn't just water, it has Salt. potassium and sodium in it. It's to keep you rehydrated. You lose electrolytes when you sweat. Why do you think your sweat tastes salty? It's because of that. And it stings your eyes. That's why. <laughs> so yesterday I talked about catalyst. Okay. What you need to know about catalyst, in case you have not written this down yet, is that it lowers activation energy. And I'll write that over here. Lowers, three words, activation energy. Okay. So what that means is this. If you want a more uh, broke down word kind of thing, I'm going to fix some what biologists have said. Some people say catalysts speed things up. No. That is wrong. And that's because they're biologists. It actually makes it, it doesn't make a reaction speed up. It makes a reaction occur easier. You need to write down that. You need to use the word easier. So how do I describe this? All right, how do I explain this? Like, what's the difference between easy and fast? Okay. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Which one of these humps would be easier to get over? Check it out. Or, or a hill. Okay, let's go with a hill. All right, if I'm riding a bike, which one would be easier to get over? Why? Okay, so you remember that reaction curve I showed you with the humps yesterday? That's what this is. What a catalyst does is take that reaction and shrink it down to make it easier. In other words, you ever heard the phrase work uh, smarter, not harder? Yeah, all these. That's what that is. Basically, what a catalyst does is take something that is this tough and make it easier. And that's, all, that's the reason why. Would you get over this hill quicker? Yeah. Yes, because it is easier. easier. That's the reason why. So yes, it does speed things up, but it does it by making it go easier. Okay? So please, that is going to be a question later, and that is something they put on every single t uh, science test, is what does a catalyst do? You need to know this, the word easier, not faster. Okay? It does make it go faster, but it does so because it's easier. Many people get that mixed up, and I still have to correct those biologists over there. So how do we use a catalyst, or how do we demonstrate we're using a catalyst in a reaction? Well, we just put, like, whatever the catalyst is above, like that. It does not react. It is not consumed in a reaction. It's just there. Remember that yesterday I showed you the video, and the lady comes in, and she's like, she's a matchmaker. She's putting things, uh, the two little students oh, together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a catalyst. She's making it easier. Uh, most of the time, we love using catalysts because of that. There's tons of research in it. The best catalyst on the planet is the most rarest, unfortunately, and it's platinum, a specific type of platinum. And so if we were using a platinum, we would put it right up here. It takes an energy curve and drops it so fast. Um, so a catalytic converter that you have in your car, you don't realize this, but in the back of the muffler, it actually increases uh, a reaction time so you don't send out more pollutant. So if you didn't have that filter, it would cause more uh, yeah, you know, pollution in our air. Yeah, no. Some people remove their catalytic converter. That's actually illegal. Cold uh, baby. Anyway, don't worry about escaping gas. We're not going to actually see that, but that is one thing we would put above their heads. Just note, when you see this guy above an arrow, it's just a catalyst. That just means. So if you see it later, it's not that big of a deal. You're actually going to use that a little bit later. Last but not least is more importantly, this thing. That's not a triangle. It's a Greek letter. Delta. Delta, and they say delta a lot, delta means change. So most of the time we're going to see delta T. That means change in temperature. What t change means is this, and you can write this down if you want. It's going to usually be the final minus initial, not initial minus final. It is important you do it in that area. Final minus initial. You know how... Uh, I mean, you want to take your ending thing and subtract it from the top part. One reason why, you want to get rid of a negative. That's the only reason why. They would do it the other way, but then you have a negative. What are you going to do? But that's all you really got to know for that. We'll do delta a lot. 
most of the time we're going to be adding heat to it. So in lab, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to be heating up some stuff. You're going to be using the delta sign above, uh, and most of the time we'll use that above like the arrow. So above the little reaction arrow, this means that you used heat. You put it up to some fire. That's all it means. You might want to write that down in case that didn't sink in, in case you're confused. Got it. Yeah. All right. So real quick, there's one little trick I'm going to show y'all. Um, I keep telling y'all some tricks, and I went over like three of them yesterday in the book, uh, in the notes. And that actually broke down what to do when you get with polys and things like that. Like, for example, you notice there are polys right here. Uh, if they're the same on each side, whenever you're balancing, you can group them together. And if you, yeah, well, if they're not, then you can't really do it. Uh, there was one more little trick I wanted to go over, and it's when dealing with uh, ones kind of like number eight and this one right here. You will end up with problems like this, but I didn't want y'all to, you didn't have to do this one, but I want to show you a little trick to quickly kind of do it. There is an order to go in every time you see these guys. Now, keep in mind, this is a special type of reaction. Uh, you're going to end up with one of these called, and they're usually called combustion. This one is not a combustion, but if it was flipped around, it would be. And how to deal with these, they're very hard to balance. You remember the one yesterday where you had the split oxygens and it caused you to have to try to figure out which one to balance first? Um, that's the kind you're going to run into. So both of the, this one right here is a combustion, and sometimes they balance out really easy. But the bigger these carbons get, the harder it is to balance because then you usually have to go back in a race and do some other kind of stuff. Um, but what I, the hint I'm going to start out with giving you here is this. Every time you see a carbon, a uh, hydrogen, and an oxygen, only those in a group, Chances are you may have a combustion reaction, about 99% of the time. Uh, sometimes they'll be flip-flop. How to deal with these guys, there is a little trick to actually do. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce you to it today, and then we're actually going to pick it up a little bit more later, uh, because I can't really go over it much until we talk about what the heck a combustion reaction is, and we haven't even talked about that yet. But here's my advice, okay? When you tell, every time you come to one of these guys, balance out your carbons first, and your hydrogens. Now I'll make you a little side note here. Carbon and hydrogen first. So anytime you see a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen kind of set up, follow this little trick and it'll save you a headache. Now these were not that bad, but they could potentially get worse. So I'm kind of giving you a help first. So number one, I would balance out the carbons and hydrogens first. The reason why I say balance out your oxygens last The reason why is because they're split. You want to get everything else balanced first, and then when you balance out your oxygens, it'll make a little bit more sense. Now you notice over here, your oxygens are split. You see the split? However, when you add them together, that causes a weird little number over here. But I'll show you how going between carbon hydrogen first, then doing oxygen last, actually saves you a lot less of a headache. Uh, so for example, if we did this normally, and see how it's split over here also, that causes some problems. So how many carbons do we have on the left side? One. One. How many hydrogens? One. Two. Do we have two? How many oxygens do we have? Three. You have two here and one here. So that's three. You see where we get to some split-minded kind of math that you have to do. Same thing over here. You count up your carbons. You got six over here. You got 12 hydrogens. And six here plus two, that's eight. Okay, so balance out your carbons and hydrogens first. It doesn't matter which one you do first, pick one. Let's do carbon. All right. Um, so you have six on the right. What do you have to put in front of here to make a six? Okay, now I'm doing it in pin, which I shouldn't. But when I did that, that also changes my oxygen. Six times two is no longer two, it's 12. 12 plus one, 13. Yikes. Okay, that's mean. Um, all right, but it's okay. We'll come back to the oxygens later. Um, okay, so we balanced out our carbons. Now let's do our hydrogens. What time, so we got 12 over here, two over here. What times two will give us 12? Six. Oh. <laughs> six. <laughs> so six times two, that'll make it 12. Carbons, hydrogens are fine. 
Now let's add up our oxygen. Six times one, that is now six. Six plus 12, 18. Okay, so a lot of people want to go down here and be like, well, what times eight will give me 18? That's not really what's going on. You got eight, six over here and two over here. You're trying to get both of these to total up to 18. So that's where we run into. You could try doubling this, but then that's going to mess up your carbons and hydrogens. This oxygen's actually last, um, or by itself. So let's try manipulating this. So basically, this is a weird formula. You're trying to get to a total of 18. Let's say we leave this 6 alone, okay? So we minus 6 out of that, you're going to get 12. What can we do to make this 12? 6. So when we do that, that changes this to 12. 12 plus 6, 18. So sometimes it's you having to solve for a missing variable kind of thing. Um, and this is just a 1 right here. Uh, that's one reason why I said kind of wait a little bit, but if you do follow the carbon hydrogens first and do the oxygens last, you'll eventually figure it out. See, that whole split that we were looking at was the one of the little problems that we were running into. I always say try to get this guy last or try to deal with him last because O2, basically anything you have by that, you want to get to an even number. Um, but basically, we did have this end up to an even number, which did help us out. If that was an odd number, we'd still have to keep doubling until we got to an even. It just makes balancing way easier. Same thing over here. You could do the same little trick. You got the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen. Six, two, one, three, two. Okay. So if we're trying to balance this one out, same rules apply. Balance your carbons and hydrogens. So... We got two on the left and one on the right. What can we put in front of here to make it two? A two. All right. Good job. So we change that to a two. Two times two, it will be four, plus one over here, five. It's like, oh, no, it's not a number. Wait, let's get done with our hydrogens first. So we got six on the left and two on the right. What times two will give us six? Three. Three. So three here. Changes that to a six. Three times one. 3, and so you end up with 4 and plus 3, right? right man. We got a problem. No, man, you did it wrong. I did it wrong? Yeah. What'd I do? It's a 6 in front of the H2O, man. Hey, man, I thought you were a teacher. Wait, 6 in front of the H2O? Yeah. Not yet it is, but it will be. I see what you're doing. Hey, I'm double checking myself there. All right, so I'm saying if you're doing it this way. It, it, it is eventually a six. It is eventually a six. Okay. But you're not wrong. Um, so we run into this little problem that we run, uh, run to right here. And this is why I said, you know, use this little trick right here. You'll notice that's an odd number. There is a quick little trick you could do. Uh, we want to make this an even number, right? right? So what could we multiply by seven to make it an even number? Two, nine. The most simplest thing, a two. To keep everything within ratio, and this is why I say balance your oxygen last, you would change the coefficient in front of every single one of these guys. This is another reason why I say don't do it in pen. Uh, you would change the coefficient in front of everything but the O2. So in other words, double everything you currently have but O2. So that would be the next step you would do right here in case you ran into this little problem. Everything... E extra thing. Okay, hold on. Let me try this again. Everything but O2. That only applies if you didn't end up with an odd number here. If you end up with an even number, it's easy because then you just got to put something in front of here and that makes it even automatically. But if you end up with an odd number, nothing by 2 can go into 7, right? Evenly. By the way, you can only use even numbers. I mean, not even numbers. I'm sorry. Whole numbers. Uh, you can't put a decimal. But what could go into 7? Or what times 2 will give you 7? 3.5. But we can't have 3.5, so if you double 3.5, what do you end up with? 7. So that's why we're doubling everything. This is already has a 1 in front of it, right? So if you double 1, you get a what? 1, 2. You get a 2. Right. All right, skip this one. Uh, you already have a 2 here if you double that. And if you double the three here, you get a six. Now you can go back and rebalance and figure out everything else. 
If you put a 2 in front of here, you doubled this. That's now 12. You also doubled your CO2. So now you have 4. You also doubled your, uh, your 3 that was here, so now that's 12. Recount up your oxygens now. 4 times 2, that's 8. 6 times 1, 6. Add those two together, what do you get? 14. 14, exactly what you were going for. Now what times 2 will give you 14? Seven. Now you're done. And some people think that is not completely reduced, but that's an odd number, so that's as low number ratio as you can get. <laughs>